Before sharing my conversation with VJ, I'd like to point everyone towards a few resources and ways they can help keep the momentum going for the Black Lives Matter movement and to listen to and amplify Black voices. In the video description below, you'll find links to educational resources about this very old problem and ways you can contribute financially to the fight against it. In the midst of the climate crisis and a global pandemic, the fight against police brutality and systemic racism is not something we can afford to let fizzle out because literally the lives and safety of black people in this country depend on it. I hope sharing these resources can be of some help. Words are cheap, and so I look forward to the long and difficult task ahead of turning my words into action. For now, please enjoy my conversation with VJ. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Reflections on Music and Nature. I'm really uh, pleased to have VJ Chalasani here with us. Uh, VJ is a violist, scholar, teaching artist, and doctoral candidate at the University of Washington. He's currently assistant professor of viola at the University of Northern Colorado and has collaborated directly with a very impressive array of composers ensembles on everything from contemporary music to indie music, as well as being an avid performer of Baroque music across the country. Uh, he also hails from Sacramento State, where we both did our undergrad. Uh, Vijay, thanks so much for making the time to do this. It's nice to have you talk to you. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. I'm happy to do this. And uh, I won't mention how many years ago you and I were in school together. It's a while, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you could answer this question, I think. Uh, but I think my first question, or I guess kind of opening, would be uh, how is your work as a performer as well as a music director influenced by the natural world and even just the idea of nature that's very rich and deep topic? Yeah, there's so many different ways we could talk about this and and actually, one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation with you was because when you first posted your inquiry looking for people interested in, in speaking for this series, I, it made me reflect on what it meant to myself, what it meant for how nature influences our music making and, and music in, in general. Uh, you, mentioned, I think, you mentioned like pedagogy too, for example, right? Mm. Like uh, the idea of natural sound and the quarter tones, uh, different tuning systems. Talk about some, maybe we could talk about some of those things that like, that are, that are drawing on nature. Totally. Um, performance practice, why don't we start there? That's definitely one of the things that I found the most fascinating in my work as a musician in these last, this last decade or so. Uh, when I first got introduced to things like temperaments and the, and the concept that equal temperament wasn't the only way of tuning music, so to speak, that really uh, lit my fire. It really opened up a new world for me. So I, f I found that looking for, to draw the connection to nature, what we might call the natural tendencies of notes has been really interesting and also applicable in all music that we play, not just Baroque music necessarily, but as I've found myself swimming more and more in contemporary music circles, you find so many examples in the modern music world where composers are looking for a slightly different sound based on whether a pitch is a little higher than normal, than equal, a little lower, and I often find that when composers are asking for things that look really odd on the page, like quarter tones, they're actually asking for something that is completely natural in sound. You know, a good example of this would be like how Berio uses quarter tones in his music, where one of his great fascinations was folk song, an Italian and Sicilian folk song and, and so that sort of fascination that he has with folk song leads him to try to figure out how we on our classical art music instruments and training how we can get that same kind of sound that completely natural effortless sound that so many folk singers of yesterday and today that we admire can obtain and it's 
completely cool to me, like totally fascinating that quarter tones are one of the ways that he and others have tried to find that. So, so you, so about intonation or tuning, I guess you're kind of alluding to the idea of like, uh, intonation that is more aligned with the overtone series, right? Which a lot yeah. of, which, you know, Barrio drew on and a lot of, I mean, there's the sort of, there's the, the just, what do they call it for in the Brogue era? The just, uh, intonation. this is not something <laughs> I know about, but, yeah. but, um, but tuning was not the same. There was not equal temperament until really the 19th century, I guess, where, where the notes, the 12 notes that make up a chromatic scale are all, they're all equal to each other. That's why it's equal temperament. But in previous tuning systems, the scales are more aligned, more closely aligned with the overtone series and, and the harmonic series. And then in the 20th century, a lot of composers are drawing on, and a lot of musicians are drawing on the overtone series because of, and you know, a lot of times appealing to this idea of, of it being closer to nature and less manipulated. Like the right. spectral composers come to mind in, in mm. France, right? Like Gerard. Yes. Music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You touch on some great things. Um, I have two things that I want to mention. One being that there's a lot of misconception among performers today that there's just a, a time in which equal temperament became the rule of the day. And I think that's not really true. I mean, you don't see it become common for, for instance, organs, which are one way of, of measuring this pretty well, until very late in the 19th century. And you know, on top of that, you have a lot of evidence in, in writings about ensembles that have the option to do non-equal temperament. For instance, string quartets or singers, in particular string quartets that are, are trained to play in their own sort of string just intonation. Very late into the 19th century and even some recorded evidence in the early 20th century. And, and to me that really shows that it's overlapping or really aligning with the traditions that then you ne next see in the 20th century with someone like, for instance, Harry Parch of completely disregarding the system of equal temperament and choosing to divert to their own natural way of hearing things, as you mentioned. So what um, do you think are the, like, the advantages of doing that I'm interested in? Because we, we know yeah. that there's something could be close to nature and something is not or whatever. Like, what is the, what's the reasoning behind using these different like systems? Why, why is, because it's a lot of trouble. Like you have to deal with, you know, different tuning system than what we have on the piano. So why, why, right. why do all these artists go through the trouble of doing this? Yeah, it's a lot of trouble. trouble. I definitely can yeah. uh, corroborate that one. Um, well, in some ways it's hard to pinpoint, but the thing that has always resonated with me has been exactly that. It's the resonance. And uh, you know, as a string player, now to talk about natural things, Sometimes this is easy to forget, but you know, as a viola player, I play with an instrument that is made completely with wood, a few little metal parts here and there, a little bow that's made of wood, horse hair, <laughs> rosin. You know, you're using all natural ingredients in this concoction that we have to make music. And there's a feeling that's different when your instrument is truly resonating. It's something I really try to get across to my students when we're talking about intonation and tuning and that sort of thing is that you can feel a difference in your body and how things are ringing together. Um, I still remember the first lesson I had and at Sac State with Anna Kruger, bless her heart, an incredible, amazing teacher and thankfully very patient for me. Um, sometime in my first or second year, I can't remember when, but I remember still the visceral feeling I had the first time in a lesson where I felt like I really truly played something in tune and how everything felt different about that, how my viola resonated in a different way, how my body felt different. And that sort of thing, I think that's why we strive to achieve intonation in this way, because for a lot of music, equal temperament just doesn't quite have the same ring and resonance, resonance as a well temperament, what we might call something that's, that's trying to balance the difference between 
the ease of equal temperament moving through different keys versus something that has a, a closer relationship to just intonation of all the notes ringing in the way that they naturally, to come back to nature, in the way that they naturally would ring. So it, it's worth making that effort in that same way that when we play music from before 1800 and we use these well temperaments and they have a different kind of ring to them. I, I think you can still apply that to both Romantic era music and then even certain 20th and 21st century music that we've talked about. Harry Parch, Ben Johnston, whoever you want to cite as your muse, what they were looking for, it comes across to just a slightly different way of hearing and a slightly different way of feeling. So it's a little bit gets to this phenomenon. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that I think especially you need to hear it like live. I mean, it's easier. You can hear it in recordings, but live it's a lot more. I think. It's more visceral like anything is right anything in a live performance, which is why right now during the pandemic crisis, we're suffering so much is because you don't it's you don't quite get the same visceral feeling from watching a recorded performance, even if it was performed live, even if all the other conditions are the same, right? There is something about being there in, in person. Maybe it's also why our generation is so, um, what's what's the word? It's where, why we're so uh, experience driven, mm -hmm. our, our generation. Could you also talk a little bit about your, some of your teaching techniques? You mentioned in our earlier conversation about, uh, about the idea of lyrical playing or imitating the human voice, which I mm. think, which is important for a lot of instruments and a lot of musicians to talk about this, but especially with strings, I would say that's, that might be especially true. If you tell a student like, this needs to sound natural or, or organic, like what are those, why are those things useful? And what do they mean? Yeah, absolutely. I, again, one of, in my humble opinion, the great misconceptions in playing and teaching today, almost everyone you talk to who plays an instrument will say, well, you don't want to sound like an instrument, you want to sound like a voice. Whether that's purely a musical voice or actually a singing voice. That's often the goal in pedagogy today, well, and not just today, but historically too, many tutors and treatises from the 18th and 19th and earlier centuries mention the importance of a singing quality to performance. Really comes to a head in the 19th century when much of the music that it was played and performed and composed has a great vocal quality to it as well. That's one of those kind of baseline things I try to get across when I teach music appreciation, for instance, teaching students who have no background in music, how do you tell the difference between the Baroque and classical era versus the Romantic era? Well, that's one of the things I really try to point out, the long singing lines. And one of the thing that, things that really comes across when you look at the 19th century is the importance of a technique called portamento, which is a connecting of the notes. Portamento is one of those things that's still common to our practices today. And if you ask any string player if they use portamento, they say, yeah, of course, that's what we do. It's something we do. Only when appropriate and only tastefully, of course, you get all these caveats as well. But when I'm talking about playing lyrically or imitating the natural singing voice when doing instrumental playing, portamento is one of those things that I really try to emphasize and get across that students have to make sure that as the line continues, they're really connecting note to note. And when that involves changing position, um, shifting as string players say, where they have to go up and down the neck of the instrument, um, that means you're invoking this technique. But it's also, if you listen to, to singers, it's just naturally what, what they do. And unfortunately, as with as singers are much the same as string players in that in the last hundred years of recorded technology, a lot of the portamento has been kind of ironed out. So you get this conception that a lot of teachers will say, 
oh no, you can't do it too slow or you can't do it too much. That just wouldn't be appropriate. It's not our taste. And of course, it's an aesthetic thing, though, don't you think? Like, yes, I mean, over time, it, with with singing, especially like in this and, and string playing too, like, you know, you listen to like early 20th century recording could sound very schmaltzy or very like mm -hmm. rich and deep. And then mm -hmm. I think like now, like, you know, the sometimes players take a more modernistic aesthetic to something that's older. So, yeah. And, yeah. and I also wonder, like, have you ever uh, encountered a situation where you actually feel like a student is playing something too lyrical or too human? -like? Because sometimes <laughs> I think there could be a situation where some, you might want something to sound machine-like or something to sound mechanical. Like, you know, somebody like Ligeti comes to mind or or, or Conlon Nancro who, uh, who wrote all those player piano pieces. Like, those are very non-human pieces. Those, mm -hmm. those piano pieces that he wrote for, um, they're they're literally for piano rolls and they're like these crazy pieces that are just impossible they're not they're literally not playable by a human and that's that's because they're played by a machine right and so like and i think there are a lot of composers too that could or styles of music that could be considered unnatural so i just i'm curious like mm. do you ever encounter situations where you think oh this is could be too expressive or or do you feel like there's always some human element i'm i'm interested in that those different uh, yeah, kind of things. That's such a great perspective and a great way of thinking of it. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this lately too. Um, I, I try to say that I'm a student of performance practice of the last several centuries. And when I say a, a statement like that, people tend to only think about earlier times like the Baroque or Classical era. But I try to mean the 20th and 21st centuries too, because I'm interested in that music too. I. I guess I'm a little bit uh, greedy, and I just I want to play all the music. You play Baroque music, and then you play you know, the Romantic stuff, and then you and then you also play modern. I mean, there are many people who specialize in only modern music, which I, which is who are you know amazing performers. But I think doing something in a lot of different fields it gives you it just gives you ideas. You know, the same way that having your hands in a lot of different stuff gives you makes you more creative. Yeah. Well, no argument here. Yeah. But the reason I bring that up is because I think there are certain performance practices from the 20th and sometimes in the 21st century that are, are exactly like you say, like in Nan Caro, yeah, it demands that exactitude. Um, Boulez, Stravinsky, Stravinsky famously was against musicians interpreting his music. He wanted them to right. execute it. So this idea of, of the fight between execution and interpretation yeah. uh, and what is natural and what I think what is natural and what isn't in performance goes right hand in hand with the discussion of interpretation versus execution. And one of the really big differences between performance practice pre 20th century and post 20th century, 20th century and beyond. And one of the reasons why this question of taste and how much is too much or, or, or too little in our time comes down to people's perspectives on that question, execution or interpretation. Now, what most people teach and perform and say is interpretation is merely execution and has very little to do with interpretation, which is to me the very natural process of a performer putting their own stamp onto a piece of music or, or a performance of a piece of music. And as you said, and as I mentioned, there's quite a bit of music from the 20th century that demands in its performance practice that you do not add anything of yourself to it. I mean, I wouldn't dream of putting something extra on Stravinsky or Boulez or certain more recent music, because that's not at all what that music is asking for. But for the most part, I think everything else, you know, including composers that we love and think of as very precise and exact, like Schoenberg or Berg, um, or more recent music like Philip Glass, that seems like it doesn't have a lot of room for what we traditionally would think of as interpretation or performers okay. Input, I think, absolutely has space for it. And, and that is 
probably why my answer to your earlier question of have I ever th told a student that they're doing too much? The answer is no. <laughs> that situation hasn't really come up for me be because of my own t taste being what it is that I appreciate a lot of performer input in these certain places. But Right. Well, I would say there's also like a thing of like, um, I mean, even somebody adding their own artistic spin, it may not be always human like, like Boulez, for example, is like his music. It's there's, it's not necessarily, see, there's my dog. It's not necessarily um, that human, but yet it's also has this energy to it in this like intensity that I think you need that I think demands like the human touch mm -hmm. also to bring out. Sure. Um, yeah. I was wondering if we could talk about some of your work that you did with the UNC or how do you, I don't know how you say it, UNC well, Common Ensemble. We call it the Uncommon Ensemble. Uncommon. Okay. There you go. The acronym. But, uh, I capitalized so, the first three letters because it's UNC, which is the university. Right. So you mentioned that you did some work uh, in the last year with the contemporary ensemble there um, that involves listening and interacting with the environment. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of the projects that you've done and and also um, and what's sort of the advantage for your students and for audiences in, in doing these kind of unusual quote unquote unusual pieces. Yeah, totally. Um, I was mentioning to you in our previous conversation how I had a lot of challenges when it came to running the Uncommon Ensemble this year in my first year teaching at UNC because of uh, not knowing before the start of the semester what my ensemble membership was going to be. I didn't know what types of instruments, what how many players we're going to have. So a lot of the planning that I was able to do involved thinking of uh, open instrumentation works from the late 20th and early 21st centuries. And as I was researching more and more down that path, one name or sort of field or or concept that kept coming coming up was the music of Pauline Oliveros, who I've been a big fan of a lot of a, for a long time. This is one of my first real chances to take a deep dive into studying her music and ethics and and that philosophies and that sort of thing. She emphasized so, listening a lot, right? In the same way yes. that, that Cage emphasized, like I mean, he was about listening too, but he emphasized like sounds. Uh, being open to sounds in your pieces for her her music is almost like so philosophical and it's so much encouraging us to be quiet sometimes and just listen to sounds around us absolutely absolutely so we programmed a couple of her pieces for a concert that we did in february this earlier this year before all the cancellations of every of everything but that was really inspiring and it really proved to create a lot of growth in the ensemble. They really started listening in a, in a different way and, and it had benefits in really unexpected places. Um, improvisations in that group became a lot deeper after we started using some of Pauline Oliveros' deep listening pieces as interactive warm-ups or games or eventually performances. Could you give an example of one of those pieces, like what's involved for people who might not be familiar with, with those? Yeah, sure. Um, I pulled up a few of them over here. Let me see. Um, great. So here, I'll, I'll give two examples. One that has a more direct nature connotation to help contextualize what I'll say next. But, um, but another that's a, a sort of a classic Pauline Oliveros piece. It's, the name is called Responsibility. It should also be mentioned that a lot of her works take the form of text scores or sometimes called word scores or word events, just words. They're almost like koans, I think, like these little philosophical statements that like, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, sometimes it's like, how do you make a piece of this? But you just have to sit and think <laughs> about it and it's right. Yeah. And, and, and that's that, it. And she's taking herself a little bit out of there too, putting and putting, you know, the, the performer Yes, which of course goes back to the conversation of interpretation versus execution. We can talk for hours about that, but um, that's one of my favorite things about the experimental composers of the second half of the 20th century, the Cages and Feldman's, Earl Brown, Pauline Oliveros, et cetera, et cetera. It's just this 
openness that they have and how they're really putting the performer back into the equation, especially someone like Christian Wolf. Anyway, the first of these pieces, it's called Response Ability. And the text says, listen for a call. When the call comes, answer with your own call. Call until you receive an answering call. Echo the answering call. Repeat the cycle three or more times. 1978. Cool. That's it. Yeah. So in, in a lot of ways, you might look at that and think to yourself, well, what the hell do I do? But if you're able to leave yourself open to possibilities, then a lot of things can happen. And, and watching the growth of my students as they became more and more open, as we experimented more and more with these pieces, especially for students who had a very wide range in my ensemble from doctoral and master's students to freshmen, um, to experienced improvisers and performers of contemporary music, to people who had never played anything later than 1910 before. It was really amazing to watch the growth of, of these students as they responded to these works like Pauline Oliveros. Great. If I could share one more, there's another one called The River Meditation. And actually she has a, a river drawn out, which is kind of fun, and the words interact intersect between the different parts of the stream. And she says, by a river or a stream, listen for the key tones in the rushing waters. Allow your voice to blend with the sounds that you hear. Which I think is just a really lovely chance to meditate and listen and embrace nature in the world. It's very evocative too. Yeah. Yeah. Are these pieces meant to be performed in the sort of traditional sense that we think about it? Probably not. Or if yes, then maybe the audience is not meant to be anyone more than the people participating in the piece itself. Yeah. But I think that's okay. And we have such this audience driven view of what a performance is. Sometimes we forget that an audience of one, just yourself, the person playing the music is an acceptable number. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you have an excerpt from a piece by Luciano Berrio, uh, Natural. Uh, could you, could you talk about why, why you're showing this piece and what, and uh, what's interesting about it for you in, in regards to it's, I mean, it's called Natural. So why, why is it called Natural? And talk about the premise of the piece a little bit. Right. Um, it connects so many of the things that we've talked about. Um, this particular section doesn't use any quarter tones that I, that I wanted to share from a performance by Garth Knox, one of my absolute heroes, a viola player who I totally adore. Um, but it does use an excerpt from a folk song that Berio transcribed. And Garth, I think appropriately, adds a lot of portamento and connections in a very vocal way. It's to me just completely evocative and beautiful. Um, as well, there's uh, the, the excerpt that I picked has three different short sections. And the third one, Berio instructs the player to play very stridently. And it takes, and it takes out the vibrato completely. And again, just very evocative in a very different way than the two previous sections, but the work, instead of nature necessarily as the natural world that we've talked about, it, it's more of the nature that we started the conversation with of what is natural in terms of expression um, and how a person or a voice or whatever can kind of naturally express themselves. Anything else? You want to say about that before we move on to the next? There's so much that could be said. Um, there is one thing that really strikes me about watching it. 
Garth, when he performs that, he's almost like a great orator. Like you can tell he's telling a story, even though in the form of instrumental music, we don't get precise text that we would if we were listening to art song or whatever. But you get this sense so strongly from the way he plays that he's saying something. Um, but there's no and, words. So we don't but there's it. no words. But there's, there's an expression about it. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, that goes into a whole separate conversation that we could have about rhetoric and its importance in music. And that's a whole nother performance right. practice thing that is also quite natural, but we don't need to go that, down that road today. Mm -hmm. I guess my last question is, uh, since we've been talking a lot about nature, I was wondering if uh, the, the crisis of climate change has at all informed or impacted the way you think about music, whether it's uh, ethical concerns or whether it's performing choices or, or maybe not. Maybe it's just a matter of continuing to do what you do. I'm tempted to use Marty's answer from your first episode of this series and simply say that I it's too stressful and I try to put it aside. But you know, at the same time, I think our generation has never not known the specter of climate change, right? Like, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're born a year or two apart, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that, frankly, I have a hard time remembering a time that I wasn't worried about climate change, even if it was simply something abstract and not something that I need to be worried about right now. Um, has that changed for me? I'm not really sure. It's a hard question to answer. But I, I think in the last few years, it's become something that's been more kind of present in my the front of my brain oh, rather really than cool. the back of my brain. Yeah. And it's something that uh, the more that I think about the way I make art <laughs> in sort of an abstract sense, uh, I kind of have two separate lives, so my educator life and my performer life. And they overlap all the time, of course, but just in terms of my performer life, thinking about what do I do, why is what I do important? It's the kind of question that artists sort of have to justify for themselves at various times, if not all the time. Mm -hmm. But in asking that question, and especially now during the pandemic when we don't have our traditional means of performing. Uh, you know, asking myself the question, why is what I do important? Um, lately, I've come a back a lot to thinking that I somehow need to wor work climate awareness or advocacy or something like that into what I do. Um, you know, luckily, there's so much music out there that is inspired by or influenced by nature. So as I mentioned to you before, I've been working on a recital project for a year or two now that hasn't quite come to fruition, but hopefully I'll have more time to work on it now during the time away from stage that we have. Um, but I'm working on a project that is essentially a recital that combines music that has themes of nature, such as the Barrio Naturale, um, of course, themes of nature, has nature as a sort of a, a central influence, whether that's Berio's look on nature in Naturale, or whether it's a piece like um, Elizabeth Lutyen's work for viola, um, The Singing Birds, this is a piece it's for um, speaker and solo viola. Um, I'm also working with some other pieces like Ursula Mamlock's From My Garden, and um, Tigran Mansurian's Ode to the Lotus, some other pieces that are, while they don't have direct nature titles, are, are um, referencing nature. I've been trying to put this project together as a means not just to perform like any other recital, but also to somehow try to help center some awareness on climate. So we'll see where it goes, but I really, I, my hope for this project is that I can make it some sort of multimedia thing where it's not just me playing the viola, but also um, other art, art, other culture that, uh, that talks about nature and our crises around nature, poetry, 
um, maybe some film as well, but something that helps us think about this impending need that we have to change what we do and change how we how we use the world so that it'll be more sustainable somehow in combination with making music. BJ, it's been really interesting talking to you. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Yeah. Uh, keep me posted on all those interesting projects. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan.